Welcome to the Sustainable Clinical Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Sarah Smith. I am a practicing rural family physician and the charting coach. This is the podcast for physicians and advanced practice providers who are ready to step back from the busyness of their clinical day to share ideas, question everything, and redesign their clinical day. We are redesigning clinical medicine to create sustainable clinical days and create time for our lives outside of medicine. Join us for discussions with world experts who are helping design sustainable models of clinical medicine and the physicians or clinicians who have discovered or designed sustainable models of clinical medicine for themselves. Welcome everybody. Today I have with us Michelle Thompson, who is here as a previously registered nurse, but now helping teams within their environment of work. Uh, Welcome, Michelle. I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, Yeah, as you said, my name is Michelle Thompson. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, so I'm Canadian. People tell me I have an accent, but I can't hear it, so I'll have to take their word for it. Um, I am a registered nurse. I still identify as such, uh, but I started my own leadership development uh, consulting company in 2018 when a group of physicians that I had worked with for a few years asked me if I could create and deliver curriculum for them. They had gotten some research funding and I had never done that, but I thought, well, I think I can, I can do this. And uh, I came home and my husband, who is the entrepreneur in the family promptly told me that I needed to start my own business. And I argued and pushed back and said, I'm not doing that for one client. I clearly lost that argument because I created Curious Consulting. And so uh, my focus now is really using a framework of psychological safety to create workplaces that people never want to leave. And I talk that I'm more of a workplace kind of specialist in terms of um, not everybody understands what leadership development really means. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's really the focus on the words matter. And it's really how we can create and hold space for other people by meeting them where they're at in that moment. Got it. Okay. So uh, these physicians who reached out to you, they obviously knew that you had some skill in this area. What were they specifically asking you for? What had they identified as a need they needed help with? Yeah. So thanks for asking. So I've worked primarily for the bulk of my nursing career in seniors housing. So long-term care primarily. So working with uh, adults that have varying degrees of dementia or, um, you know, memory uh, challenges, some of which are age-related, most are not. And um, we actually, in the home that I was overseeing at that time, we had some of the best outcomes, clinical outcomes in kind of that geographical catchment area. And we were kind of known as the, um, you know, the place to be if you were looking for advanced dementia care. And so a lot of our nurses uh, had were new graduates when they came to us and hadn't really developed the autonomy and the critical thinking skills to be able to engage with some of the physicians in this group on an on-call basis. And so many of the physicians that the nurses would talk to didn't know the residents that lived in our homes. And so they really relied on the nurses being able to be the eyes and their ears and being able to give them the information they needed to know, not sometimes all the other stuff that nurses tend to offer that's not helpful to physicians. Mm -hmm. Um, And having been a previous ICU nurse in a previous life, I you know, got scolded once and I only needed to get scolded once in the middle of the night by a physician when he told me that when I knew what I wanted him to order and the dosing to call him back and he would do that. And so I really learned the importance of uh, being able to be the eyes and the ears for a physician so that, you know, they can give you what they need, but also, um, you know, you can serve your patients in the best possible way. So we did a lot of, uh, you know, education on how to empower the nurses to have the autonomy and the critical thinking skills. And the outcome really was to reduce the number of inappropriate transfers from long-term care to the acute care sector, which was Mm -hmm. bogging up sometimes emergency departments. And so we reduced our numbers significantly. And they basically said, can you just teach everyone else how to do what you're doing? Okay. So please teach us how to make our nurses critical thinkers and advocates for their patients to help improve quality for our patients. I get that. That's totally a measurable goal. And there's things in there, modules you can put together that help identify that. So then what did you notice about the environment for, uh, if we're talking about environments where people want to stay, they want to work, why was this better for the team? Why did they want to stick around? 
Well, you know, that's a great question. And and I think that when, before I, you know, started this, this uh, journey of leadership development, I mean, I've been on the journey for over 27 years, but you see sometimes these things as happy byproducts. It's not really the goal you're aiming for, but at the end, it's this added bonus that you get. And so what I knew to be true is that people who don't feel safe in an environment or they don't feel that they can trust leaders or don't feel value seen and heard tend to not always behave well in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And those that do are really those that are feeling like they're being valued and heard. And so we really tried to, as a first go forward, is to let the nurses know why we were doing this. It was to help them kind of improve their critical thinking skills and give them the empowerment to feel that they weren't afraid to call a physician in the middle mm -hmm. of the night or a doctor on call because many of them were afraid or had had mm -hmm. bad experiences. And so it was really to try to help them feel empowered through this by giving them the knowledge. Um, and then, you know, it also improved the working relationship between the physicians and the nurses because the doctor would ask them, well, what do you think I should do? You've mm -hmm. seen them for the last eight hours. What do you think is a good course of action based on what you've seen. And the nurses had never had that level of engagement with physicians before. And I think that because they became better communicators all around in terms of the tools and the resources we gave, gave them to develop those skills, ultimately the team, the interdisciplinary team worked much more efficiently together. So we had carries that were working better with the clinical team, like the um, advanced practice LPNs and RNs, and then also even just with our housekeeping and support services staff, you know, those people I think sometimes can left get left out of the conversation around the way that we um, care for seniors in our homes because they're not seen as front facing clinically offering positions. And yet when a housekeeper goes into a resident's room to maybe clean their room, um, they need to know if this person has responsive behaviors or if they're potentially a risk or they've had an off day, they're going to be engaging in conversations with them that can often either exacerbate a situation or in some cases can be really calming and comforting to a resident who might just be having a bad day. So I think that all of those things together, I think helped us to start to create a more solidified approach where we all felt like our feet were all pointing in the right direction. Yeah, okay. We mm -hmm. hear significant improvement in teams when everyone can work to scope, when they're being valued for the things that they can bring to the team, when they feel like they have a voice. I can see why the team were engaged and enjoying this process um, because they did get to work top of scope. They were using their skills and voices and being valued for that. So fantastic. Okay, so it moved out of aged care then. You're moving now, you're not just looking at aged care teams. Tell us uh, what else you've what else you've worked with and what else you've taught. Yeah, so when I started my um, own business, I really truly thought I would be doing more of what I did for this physicians group. I thought I would be creating and delivering curriculum, which I love to do. I love facilitating and I love being in that space of learning. And I also learned that sometimes when you start a business, the things that you think you're going to do and love are not the things that you end up loving and doing. And so I realized really quickly that as much as I created the curriculum, I didn't love delivering it to over 50 long-term care homes. Over time, I just found it was sort of this rinse and repeat and it, and it lost the luster. I loved the engagement and the energy you get in being in a space with adult learners, but I just didn't love kind of repeating the same curriculum over and over again. So that was one thing I really learned. And I thought that I would be a consultant that did what other consultants I had seen do over my career, which was create policies and procedures for organizations that didn't want to do that. And they hire externally. And then I thought, well, gosh, that's not really what I want to do at all. And so I had to go back to an incident that happened when I uh, first was starting kind of, I would say, I had been leading in a few other places, but this was the first really big opportunity I had had to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of a long-term care home. And I moved across country to take the job and was told that things were going really, really well. I'd had a few interviews and things did seem that way when I started. And around month three or four, I started to subtly feel the the um, attitudes of the staff shift in a way that didn't feel great. And I couldn't figure out what was happening. 
only to come to work one morning and my admin assistant had said to me, licensing is on their way. And I, here in Canada, licensing officers will often come to your home just to ensure that you're doing what you say you're doing and you're giving good care. And I said, well, that's fine. We have nothing to hide. And she said to me, no, I don't think you understand. They're coming to investigate you because one of our nurses called and accused you of asking her to cover up the death of a resident. And I literally in that moment felt the blood drain from my body. And not because I knew it was true, but because of the opposite. I knew it wasn't true, but I'd only been working for this employer for a couple of months. And I thought, what if they believe that this is really true? And I've, I've asked this person to do this. So fast forward two full days of an investigation, it was clearly identified that I did not do what I was accused of doing. And so when the nurse was asked, why did you do this? She said, well, we really like her, but we just want everything to go back to the way that it was. And we figured if we could get her fired, things would just go back to the way they were. And I really realized in that moment that I was ill-equipped to manage a dysfunctional team that had learned behavior. And I came to learn that I was, I think, this the sixth general manager of as many in six or seven years. So basically one new person a year had gone through this building. And that wasn't disclosed to me. Now, I don't think that my employer at the time intentionally set me up for failure, but I think that I'm like most employees that get hired by organizations whereby people hire you because you have the competencies to deliver on the outcomes of a job. And then they think you're just going to figure the leadership piece of it out. And I argue that really what we need to be doing is training leaders to be leaders. How do I show up as a leader? How do I help to support myself? And in doing so, I then show up as the best version for other people. And so that was the story that led me to kind of rebrand and reframe the work that I'm doing now to really be able to teach people that the words that we use matter, how we communicate matters, and that leadership is actually not that difficult. And I think we've made it far more complicated than it needs to be. Relationships can be challenging at times, but I think that when you understand that we're more alike than we are different and how our brains are intrinsically hardwired to connect with other people, it's almost like having a superpower. When you know how our brains are hardwired, it can make it much easier to um, get to a place of being able to have people trust you and who want to follow you. Because I really truly believe that leaders have two jobs. It's my job to keep people safe and it's my job to build trusting, respectful relationships with people. Yeah. All right. So then if you went back in time to talk to Michelle as she started this job, what do you think you might've done differently as you took this position that might've had now that you're understanding about teams and leadership and things, what would you have done differently in that environment, do you think, if if anything? Yeah, that is a great question. And believe me, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that <laughs> over the years. And it's it's actually something that I ended up doing as a fallout of what happened mm-hmm. afterwards, because I went through months where I was I actually started having panic attacks going mm-hmm. to work every morning. And I, my feelings were hurt. I thought like here I was trying to create this environment that was better for people and working all these hours. I was single at the time with no kids. And I thought, how could they do this to me? Like I felt so betrayed on some levels. And so what I ended up doing was I thought, okay, I have two options. I can either quit my job and go work someplace else and likely end up finding myself in a toxic environment. It's healthcare after all. There's unfortunately a lot of toxicity. Um, Or I can dig my heels in and be the stubborn Leo that I am and figure this out. And so I opted, obviously, to do the latter of the two. And what I ended up doing is I spoke with every single employee in that building. And I asked them three questions. What is the, like, what is your desired outcome that you want from work every day? What is the experience that you're getting right now? And if you were me, what would you do differently? And I was able to, and sometimes people weren't able to answer all those questions because no one had asked them that before. So I would say to them, you know what, go away and think about it. And if you think of something, come back and let's talk about it. Cause I'm truly interested in what you have to say. And so after a couple of weeks of, you know, doing this a few times a day, I was able to really kind of pull together a, you know, a spreadsheet of sorts of, of areas that I was able to focus on. And really what I found is that The experience that people wanted when they came to work was to feel that they were trusted to do their job well, 
They felt in many cases they were being micromanaged and being told. So work was happening to them, not for them. They weren't really engaging in the things that they felt mattered. So things like, um, you know, when we were doing um, employee engagement activities or, um, you know, showing our appreciation, uh, they were things that the staff didn't see as a, they didn't appreciate them. So, you know, I'm, I used to be embarrassed to admit that I was one of those managers that used to have the pizza parties and staff, that's not what they wanted. They didn't want a pizza party. In fact, they wanted me to bring in a student massage therapist and offer back massages for five or 10 minutes on their break every day. Like that was what they were looking for. So I think that there was just a lot of what came out of that was I'm not being asked. I'm not being asked how I can participate in something bigger than me. And so what ended up happening was they were just coming to work every day and it became a task focused job for them. They weren't thinking about how am I actually enriching the life of this individual that I'm caring for. It just became an issue of, okay, today's a bath day. Today's I got to get them up, get them to the dining room, feed them, change them, and I go home. And, and the residents weren't getting the care they deserved. And the staff didn't feel good about it. So there was really a lack of pride of work. And mm. so we started focusing on some of those things that I feel by the time I left three and a half years later really started to move the needle. Okay, that's really helpful and concrete um, picture for us. Thank you, because I think the that is what a lot of people feel at work is they're just there to you know tick off this many patients and this many charts and this many inbox items, and they don't feel like they're able to give the care in the way they want to. And you were able to turn that around by asking some good questions and as a leader, truly trying to change the direction of what was happening in the day for these employees, which was um, the next step, obviously. <laughs> it's not just hearing what could be better, but actually starting to make possible changes. I'm going to say that wasn't an easy process for you personally to hear that feedback um, and then to actually make changes. What was required to make the changes? Did that require you going then back to management for funding for these projects? Did it mean meetings or teaching? What what happened? Yeah. So I didn't end up having to ask for any funding. I, you know, where we ended up landing with this was, you know, often we would talk about what, what often came up was, well, we can't give the care that we need because we're so short staffed, but there's not enough people. And, you know, while that wasn't untrue some of the times, and that was, you know, a difficult thing to argue, there was also a lot of downtime that I found where staff were not doing the things that they needed to be doing and otherwise doing things that they preferred to do, dare I say. So, you know, I think that I really had to say to them, listen, if we're going to have these conversations and we have to be honest, we have to be honest with each other. Let's not pretend that for eight hours you're running yourself ragged because I know that there's times that you're not. And I know that only because I'm curious enough to look and we have cameras in every angle of all the floors so I can see what's going on. So let's just be honest with each other. That was the first thing. If we're going to have a respectful conversation, then we need to agree that one of the core values we share is that we're going to be honest and we're going to be transparent. So once we were able to do that, I think then, you know, the staff really felt as though um, as long as they were trying to get towards kind of this outcome of the residents getting better care, that I would be open and willing to listen to any suggestion that they brought to me. Um, and so what we, you know, started doing was looking at things like, um, instead of adding more staff to the floor, we looked at where are we maybe misaligning the resources that we have? So who's doing what and when? And is that the best mm -hmm. time and the best person to be doing it? Let's look at that a little bit. And then I created a rule, um, which ironically, a few years later, the nurses pushed back on. So the rule was that if I'm going to add something to your workload, then we have to take something away. So we have to look at, you know, all of the things that we're currently doing and what can take away. And at the time when I started, the nurses were all doing all vital signs every single day. Now, that's okay in an acute care environment or where maybe you have a disease process where you need to be monitoring those vital signs. But most of our residents are not. And we have a, you know, home-like environment. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not checking my blood pressure every day at home. So why are we doing it here? 
And the nurses really pushed back and said, no, we need to do this every day. And I said, okay, I respect that, but tell me clinically why, what are mm -hmm. you doing with that information and how is it impacting in a positive way, the outcome for the resident care? And they were never able to give me an answer as to like why they were doing this. Just, well, it's the way we've always done it. So we just have to keep doing it that way. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was really where I loved to play in that space of really challenging the status quo and saying, just because we did it that way before doesn't mean we should now. It's, you know, kind of when you know better, you do better. It's the definition of insanity. If you keep doing the same thing over and over and you expect a different outcome, it doesn't happen. So we really got to that place of saying, I want to help you and I want to support you. I want you to have a better work balance experience and, and well-being at work. So if we're going to add this one thing, then we have to take this one thing away. And like I said, they pushed back a lot, but ultimately in the end, they, they conceded and realized that um, a lot of the things that they were doing were not things that were serving our residents anymore. And, and the acuity of our residents changed significantly you know, year over year, we were getting residents that had a much higher acuity with many more comorbidities that were coming in, or they were more in advanced stages of dementia, where the things that we were doing before in terms of rehabbing people weren't effective. They weren't rehabbing to go home. We were just trying to provide the best quality of care in the time that we had them with us. So um, yeah, it was, I think, really looking at also defining our philosophy of care. So not just our shared core values, but what is the philosophy? What is the outcome we want for our residents? And how can we each individually own that so that everybody could see themselves as part of the bigger piece? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. So we can see clearly the goal for the whole team was better quality of care for our patients and a better patient experience. And then we get the step back and saying, what are you all doing with your time? And where can we get back some of that time so we can do some of the things we want to do to give you and them, the patients, a better experience. Wonderful. Because even if you're in a clinical space, you can see how this is still relevant that what's everybody doing with their time and what are we not achieving that we want to achieve and how can we start to do things differently so we can start to do things we want to achieve or we can get people doing things at the top of their scope and not just doing busy work yeah, yeah. yeah. so tell us now then where did you go from here out of aged care did you or are you still in the aged care se section yeah, so I still uh, part-time work as a VP of operations for a seniors housing organization, primarily because the owner of the organization is such a wonderful man and has given me autonomy and really freedom to uh, make the best decisions that I feel as a VP of operations on behalf of the organization and has said, I don't need to know anything until things aren't going well. And then you need to let me know. Um, and so it's really by all means the job that I've been waiting my entire career for. And, um, you know, I started a bit before the pandemic really thinking, okay, like, let's see what happens. And then the pandemic happened. And of course, all around the world, seniors housing, long-term care, we were the eye of the storm. And there was no way I was walking away from, you know, our teams at that point and the organization. And I love it so much that it's just part of, I think, who I am and how I identify myself as a nurse, that it's really something that doesn't feel like work anymore. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm staying on um, until uh, I, I can pass the baton to someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And then in your work with teams, is that, uh, in what spaces do you work now with uh, physicians, uh, clinicians and teams? Yeah. So primarily in healthcare, but again, I've, I've worked outside of healthcare as well. And a couple of my coaching clients have not been in the healthcare space. Uh, so for organizations, it's really working with organizations for them to understand the importance of leadership development and how to how to develop their leaders to be able to be those leaders that engage their staff. And so I also learned that I had to learn to speak the language of senior executives. And so, you know, I think it's always been this zero sum where, um, you know, it's been about meeting the bottom line and to do that, you have to spend money. And so that's a bit counterintuitive. And, and I argue to say that, you know, if you're not spending money on leadership development, then your bottom line ultimately is going to pay the price. And by the way, our focus should not be on our patients. It should be on our people first, because when our people are happy and feel fulfilled and feel that 
you know, you're putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak, your patients will get better care and better outcomes. That is just the truth. And there is a ton of research studies that show that that evidence is, is there. And so it's really just getting them to, to flip things and kind of put things on their head a little bit. Um, with leaders themselves, I often have leaders that will come to me for coaching um, where they feel often caught between the people that they're there to lead and the needs of the organization. And they don't really know how to dance between those two in a way that feels that they're being authentic and staying true to their core values and not compromising or a word I hear sometimes is selling out, um, mm -hmm. which can be exhausting and lead to burnout and all of those things we hear so much about now. So um, in that space, those are kind of the individuals, but I created my own leadership development program. That was the first thing that I started when I started my, um, my consulting business and it's called lead from within. And it's a 16 week program that I actually partner with one of the colleges here in Canada. So they have it on their micro credentialing program for international students, but I still hold the rights to it. So I still offer it a few times a year to small cohorts of individuals so that you can get that um, experiential but shared learning experience with people that come from different environments. And it really walks uh, people through kind of the, the areas that I found were most impactful when I was learning my leadership development. So it's it's the framework is the person-centered leadership approach, and it's really an acronym for um, personal connections, emotional intelligence, R is respectful communication, S is self-care, O is the ongoing learning, and then N is leaving no one behind. And that's really the workplace culture perspective. So, yeah. Yeah, love it. Thank you for um, showing welcome. us that. Because I think the when you say leadership, you're right. Everybody comes to that with a different understanding or a level of confusion of what does it mean? Leadership training. Yes, of course, you know. But as physicians and clinicians, we're often in a leadership position, even when we don't want to be. You're part of leading the team that's caring for your patients. So um it's interesting to hear what does that truly mean from your perspective and, and what sort of skill development happens when leadership skills are developed. Um, how do people find you if they're looking to learn more? Yeah, so thank you so much. The best place really is just to go to my website, which is Curious Consulting. So kind of the, I wish the one thing I wish I could take back when you asked that question was, I would not have called my business Curious Consulting. I thought I was being cute Curious is the Latin for health and no one knows what it means or how to spell it. So not a great choice for a company name, but it's C-U-R-I-S and it's .ca because I'm in Canada. Uh, I do have, I am on LinkedIn um, quite a lot uh, and I do have an Instagram account. I just feel so old when I'm over there and I cannot figure out the algorithm and all the things and I'm I'm not even going to TikTok. So uh, the best place just to find me is on my website and everything else is is there. So you can find everything there. Yeah. Um, I have a question about toxic environment. So a lot of uh, individuals within an organization may identify as a toxic environment or a toxic person in their team. What are some of the things that you might advise if people are having that experience and want to know what to do? <laughs> Yeah, well, the first thing I always tell people to do is that you have to keep yourself safe. So don't ever put yourself into a situation with someone who has exhibited toxic behavior before if it means that you're going to be putting your mental health or your physical health in danger. That's the first thing. Um, if it's not, you know, that toxic, then I think that um, we every person likes to at least be offered the opportunity to engage in a one-on-one -on -one conversation before you maybe have to escalate that. And so to really approach the person and in a private way say, listen, there's been something that's been concerning me and I'd love the opportunity to talk to you about it so that I can understand your perspective. I feel like maybe I'm missing something here. And this is the hardest thing often is to kind of conjure up the empathy when someone is being toxic and they're not always being kind the idea of being empathetic can seem so counterintuitive because a lot of people feel that that's something you need to earn. And I'm not here to make the decision on whether or not that's earned or not. However, I do think that people have a right 
to be heard and to be listened to, even when we know that their opinions may differ from ours. And I think really that's showing up as a tremendous leader is when we don't get into these polarizing conversations that just because I don't agree with you means that we can't get along, I can't respect you, or I can't respect your opinion in other areas. And so I try to start the conversations from that place of curiosity and humility. This is something that's happened for me. When this happened, I felt unsafe, whatever it was, try to get away from that sandwich model because we know now it doesn't work. Um, and so to really just kind of state how I'm feeling in this situation, here's the story I'm telling myself. The story I'm telling myself is that you don't respect me and I don't feel valued when I'm in your presence. Can you explain to me if I'm getting that right? And give the person the opportunity to, and without trying to be defensive. Now, some people are going to embrace that opportunity and see this as an opportunity to get to a place of like, how can we support each other? And there's going to be other people that are not going to pick that up and they are going to get defensive. And I think in those cases, you can carry that as far as you can. And then sometimes you have to just end the conversation and say, um, my intention wasn't to, you know, upset you or to make you more angry. I'm here because I truly wanted to understand your perspective because it's very evident that it's different than my lived experience. However, this doesn't seem to be working. So I'm going to end this conversation. And if you ever decide that you want to talk to me about this in a calm and respectful way, I'm here to listen. And sometimes you just have to, you know, end that conversation and agree to disagree. However, if bad behavior continues, that's something that I always tell people to not wait until it gets so intolerable that your mental health is suffering for it. Because I heard a quote many, many years ago that I've shared many, many times, and I wasn't even doing HR leadership development at the time. And it is that the culture of an organization is shaped by the worst behavior it's willing to tolerate. And I think that when we are willing to tolerate bad behavior, we show up every day feeling like we're losing a part of our soul because every day we just feel like we're compromising and we're not standing up and we're dimming our voice or you know our belonging. And when you don't tell your employer if they legitimately don't know, they can't fix it. And I've always told people that. like I want to hear the good and the bad because I don't always know what's going on. Sometimes leaders are the last to know. And if mm -hmm. they don't know, they legitimately can't support their people and fix it. So it is important to, I think, be able to, again, be a leader who creates a safe space where if people need to challenge the status quo, or if they have an issue at work, that they feel safe enough to bring that forward without the fear of retribution. Nice. Thank you. I think that's very helpful for a lot of people here because they have either that feeling like they don't have a lot of control in their environment or that they're living within a toxic environment. So thank yeah. you for that. They were You're good pearls of wisdom. All right. Well, I, I know that this was an excellent conversation. Learned lots. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to bring forward before we end up today? No, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for your time. It's always just nice to connect with other people's communities. So thank you so much. Yeah. And it's so heartwarming to think about aged care um, and teams being able to uh, access resources that can really bring forward the, the quality for their patients and the well-being of the team members. So I hear all the time we're short staff, there's not enough staff, we're all here just to do our jobs, but uh, sounds like you really were able to create a model that could change that. So thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day, everyone. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Thank you for being part of the Sustainable Clinical Medicine podcast. If you'd like to learn more or join us to help you get home with today's work done, go to chartingcoach.ca. There you'll find all the information on the premier lifetime access charting champions program that is helping physicians get home with today's work done with all the proven tools, support and community you need to create time for your life outside of medicine. We would love to see you there. Until next time, thanks for listening.